Good morning, everybody. What I will address is the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, the fact that it is part now of the Moscow Patriarchate since the year 2007, and um, I will talk about some of the implications of that for our current situation and for how we address um, church life going forward. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so I'm, I'm talking about something very granular and specific that I think is nonetheless an example of several important big problems that we are talking about. One of the problems is what is church, right? Is it a building? Is it an organization? The other problem was initiated yesterday and will be continued today, which is the whole active measures of um, Ruski Mir and Vladimir Putin and his effort to control public opinion in the United States through a rapprochement between traditionalists and conservatives um, in Russia and in the United States. So whereas we're a small granular church, we're part of bigger problems. So I start with um, the 2007 Act of Canonical Communion with the Moscow Patriarchate, and um, I think we have to get out of it. I'll give you my conclusion right away. Let's see if this is gonna work. I'm supposed to do this for the next slide. Ah, this of course is our patron icon that, that guides our church, that guides all the meetings of the bishops, and I felt it was appropriate to start with it because this icon will be guiding the meeting of the bishops as they decide who our next metropolitan is. Um, now, there were many meetings before reunification. Whoops, it's okay. It, it'll be fine. There were many meetings to discuss the terms and conditions for canonical reunion. Um, Father Seraphim famously spoke of it as a process of forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, the laity really were not involved um, at all. This was kind of an ecclesiastical thing between churchmen. Um, I even recall that there was a council meeting where a lot of women, myself included, signed a protest letter because there were literally no women included in the process. But as you can see, people met, people discussed, people reached conclusions on what the canonical union would be. Um, we were down to two interlocutors at the end, Metropolitan Loris and Patriarch Alexei, and the relationship between them from all evidence was respectful, prayerful, warm, genuine. I cast, I personally cast no aspersion on either one of them. I think that, that they meant to do what they meant to do in 2007, which is to reunify two parts of a church that they both perceived as broken. There were um, conditions and discussions wanted to recognize the royal martyrs. Um, the, um, there was also the problem of previous collaboration with the Soviet regime. I'm still not doing really well with this clicker. Okay, here we go. And somebody caught this picture, which I think is, is kind of precious because they look like they're whispering to each other. I don't know if it was posed or not. Now, what was happening in reality at the time of the reunification? Uh, already the Russian government had operationalized a plan to sort of influence American public opinion and to create this Ruski Mir image that somehow Russia was going to, the Russian church was going to unify all Orthodox through, throughout the world. And there is a very sort of challenging document that was put out by several researchers, the Kremlin Playbook 3, Keeping the Faith, from which I quote extensively on this slide because it explains why our small church became important for the Moscow Patriarchate and more importantly for the Russian government. It was a symbol of post-revolutionary sort of ending of the schism, and it was also important as a symbol 
that all Russian Orthodox would be united, that there was no conflict anymore, that we were now in a post-revolutionary period, and in effect that Mr. Putin was walking in the footsteps of the czars. I mean, he stood there throughout the very long service. Um, it was a very long service, I can tell you. It was like four hours. You know, I don't think he was there the full four hours, but he was there a large part of it. And even at the time, I remember wondering, why does he care? Why does the president of a country need to spend this much time with a bunch of church people from New York City who, yes, they're singing beautifully. I have to say that, that the singing was, was wonderful, that, that um, several people in the crowd here were part of it, at least one, and it was, be it was beautiful. Um, but why is, he, why is the president doing this? You know, and what we didn't realize is that it was part of an ideology part of Ruski Mir ideology, part of an appeal to us as being sort of also anti-Western. And what happened after this actually, well, I love this picture. There he is in between, you know, making it happen. It was important enough to him. I just can't resist these, some of these pictures. Come on, come on. Uh, this is my favorite in a way. As we remember kisses in the gospel. Um, I feel that we were duped. I feel that we were all lied to. Um, I don't know who took the picture, it's out on the internet. So I'm not committing, I hope, any um, travesty by showing it. But after this, the church abroad starts supporting the ideology of the Moscow Patriarchate and of the Putin regime. If you go back to 2017, the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, and you read what our synod in New York published about the Russian Revolution, it blames the Russian Revolution on everybody in the West as though the West came and created the Russian Revolution. Now, Sister Vasa referred to this yesterday, that yes, I too was told the Jews and the Masons caused the Russian Revolution, but I was also raised as an American patriot. I was told that the United States gave us freedom of religion, which no other country would do, and that was very much a part of the ideology of Rokor when we were growing up. We spoke truth to power. We went and protested against people being imprisoned in, in Russia. And suddenly in 2017, it's like, oh, revolution. Oh no, the West gave us the revolution. We had nothing to do with it. You know, our czar was wonderful and Putin is our new czar. So that occurs merely 10 years after the reunification. Okay, now, in 2007, where was the Russian Orthodox Church abroad? We always said we were part of the Russian Orthodox Church, right? We were a New York corporation, but more importantly, since 1920, um, Patriarch Tichon had blessed the bishops who were in diaspora because of the Civil War because of all of the dislocation to organize their own lives. And this actually echoes Father John's talk. Yeah, you need to organize things. So you have several bishops in a country, you have several bishops in a city, there's a civil war, they can't get across borders, they can't get directions. Patriarch Tichon is clearly under duress. He's probably executed, we don't know, we'll never know. So they have to organize their ecclesiology. And it's a decree number 362. And I will say here, parenthetically, those of you who are tracking what Metropolitan Anufri is now doing in Ukraine, he almost tracks the logic of decree 362, almost paragraph by paragraph. Not exactly, but he's clearly read it. Um, after World War II, Rokor comes to New York, is incorporated, is granted tax exemption, and adopts its own regulations, adopts its own diocesan boundaries, parish boundaries, 
and the bishops usually are appointed unanimously, sometimes maybe not, and the first hierarch is appointed um, by the council or sabor of bishops. And I've handed out a couple of things to, um, for you to read. One is a big long thing about Decree 362 for those who want to, and one is a little table comparing what happened in 2007 with what went before. Now, the supreme authority of our church, make no mistake right now, is Patriarch Kirill of Moscow. I will refer to him as Patriarch respectfully, Sister Vasa, but I do want all of us to understand that. That is who the head of our church is. He's commemorated in Rokor churches, and Rokor reinforced that. What's wrong? Okay, I'm speaking of church as in, fine, and this is a very good reminder. Okay, good. Um, the thing is that new bishops have to be approved by Moscow. They could also change our regulation. And we need to, to be very, very aware of that. Um, why is this? Here we go. Um, the other thing is the act of canonical communion was premised on something. It was premised on the extermination of atheist government in the leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church as organization, not as um, church in the, in the bigger sense. And at the time, because I'm a lawyer, I can't help being legalistic, I thought that reunification was appropriate because I thought, well, there are lots of problems with Putin. He's probably not a Democrat, but we can no longer speak of this as an atheist regime. I now realize that I was probably wrong, and so were a lot of people who thought that reunification is the right thing. I think that the 2007 Act we entered into under some false pretenses. Um, you know, you can't have an organization that is headed by the secret police of a country and say that it is a religious organization, and that is clearly what we have happening now. Uh, it's, it's very much a problem and a, and a challenge for all of us, and it is, I emphasize again, this is how Ruski Mir and Putinism has inserted itself into many organizations. We are just one example. Um, what would be the basis for us to exist if we said no reunification? We still have that decree number 362. Uh, we still have an invasion and a civil war and borders that are unclear, right? And in 1927, the Sabor said, we cease administrative relations with the church in Moscow until restoration of normal relations with Russia. We don't have normal relations with Russia right now. Nobody does, right? Russia's threatening nuclear war. The United States has imposed all these sanctions. And we may need to go back to the 1936 temporary regulation. I don't know. I don't have an answer to this question. The European Commission almost sanctioned the patriarch. As I think somebody mentioned yesterday, it was only Hungary that prevented it. Um, let's see. So, I think the Reunification Act was not a legal act. I think it was canonical. I don't think, I haven't found any evidence that it was legally entered into as a contract. In fact, if there was a contract, I can't see what the um, quid pro quo was. In a contract, you usually exchange something. It's not clear what canonical status Rocor would have. That's true. That needs to be reviewed. We need to review everything. Um, let's see, am I going back and forth? Yes, I'm sorry. I 
I think that must be the end. Okay. Um, I wanted to say a few other things. I think that we have severe challenges in addressing this issue. Um, a number of our clergy uh, have taken on Russian citizenship. We do not know which clergy have Russian citizenship. We do not know what funds went between Moscow and New York and when. I think all of that needs to be dealt with transparently. We have the possibility that some of our clergy or some of our laity may be subject to the Foreign Agent Registration Act, which is an act that imposes responsibility on you for being a foreign agent, whether or not you are a citizen of another country. Uh, the most recent person who was nabbed by this was an intern who was helping write Mr. Saakashvili's press releases. She was deemed to be a foreign agent and had to go register appropriately with um, the Department of Justice. I think that our situation in New York causes us a problem not only as members of ROCOR, but also as Americans, because there's a severe national security issue for anybody who attends a church that is headed by the representative of a foreign government. And I think everybody needs to think about this very carefully. I think that the time for speaking about this within our church and to our clergy is appropriate. Very sadly for all of us, Metropolitan Hilarion died. We are in a period of locum tenens. I am very, very grateful to Metropolitan Mark over in Munich for actually taking a position. Bishop Hilarion did not take, a, Metropolitan Hilarion did not take a position on the war. Our church took the position of Patriarch Kirill. There has been a change. Metropolitan Mark took the position that there is no excuse for the war. So that is, I think, extremely positive. There's also the possibility that the new Metropolitan will be selected in September, so we can talk about how the church might be reorganized or whatever between now and September. I would, as an individual, say that the next Metropolitan cannot be a Russian citizen, for example. That would be my individual opinion from a national security perspective. Other people may have different opinions. Um, so I think that, that we have to, I haven't been watching time. Am I out of time? Yes, no? Yeah. Um, so I think these are, these are very challenging issues and we're a small part, but I emphasize that we're a very small part of a very big picture and we're an important part of the picture to the Russian government because they viewed us as the vanguard for showing that Russia is back. Russia is back as the leader of world orthodoxy. And here I, I wanna add one more point. There is something strange that happened throughout Eastern Europe after the fall of communism. There was somehow this idea among the Orthodox churches that they had to distinguish themselves from the West and that Western democracy and Western human rights were somehow unorthodox. And I think that this is very much an ideology that has been carried by people like Putin and Orban. We even see it in Greece. Greece really had to struggle to adopt some of the more modern human rights legislation that it only adopted in the 21st century. For example, uh, spousal rape. Greece had to be pushed into criminalizing spousal rape because that's a human right that is not appropriate in an Orthodox country. And I don't mean to pick on Greece, okay, with all due respect to the Greeks in the room, but there is somehow this antithesis between human rights and liberal democracy on the one hand and orthodoxy, and that is completely false. It's just not there. And, and, and this is being brought to us not because um, it is religiously true, but because it is politically convenient for someone. And once we realize that it's about politics, it's not about God, I think things become a little bit clearer. And here I'll stop, any questions?
photograph. Okay. Yeah. You photograph it. Bring it up. To ah, okay. That's okay. That's okay. We should be live. Okay. Sorry. Apparently, I need two hands for this. There. We've had, we've lost so many. Oh. First, a comment. I called CNN, I don't know how many times before the current war. They would have a program on it. The Kremlin says, and what do they show? St. Basil's and Red Square. Not the Kremlin, but St. Basil's. And so in the minds of a lot of Americans, the two are conflated. Okay. Mike, I have two questions. The first is, UK's 362, from what I understand, initially applied to Russia during the Civil War, to the areas that were under the whites or not under the reds. Is that correct? Yes, that is my understanding also. And I also, it's my understanding that in the West, it applied to Metropolitan Yevlogi rather than the people in Yugoslavia who are the forebearers of ROCOR. I thought it applied to both, but maybe there are people in the room who know better, Sister Vasa. Would you answer that one? I thought it applied to both. Don't hit me. No, no, no it's okay. She won't hit you. Uh, Though Ukaz 362 does not refer specifically to whom it refers. It says in the case, you know, of, of the movement of borders and also, you know, things that the patriarch of uh, Tikhan at the time doesn't know will happen, uh, you know, the church administration, as you said, could be organized independently until the time resumes when it's possible to have contact, normal contact with the center, right? Right, so that's and because I'm looking at George here and his grandfather was so instrumental in all of these interpretations, I have to mention that, that he did a wonderful job in sort of solidifying the status of the church abroad. I don't know that collectively we would find 20 people now who could, who could do all that together, but probably something similar has to be done. So I guess there's your answer. Okay. It could have applied to both. Okay, my second question is this. What about the 700 pound gorilla in the room? The Orthodox Church in America, which was granted autocephaly by Moscow in 1971, why did Rokor merge with that? I do not know the answer to that question. I do not know if it was considered. I think it is, that's a very long discussion. My, I would hazard the guess that Rokor viewed itself as part of the church in Russia and was hoping for reunification in Russia. I also do think that there, is, there are cultural um, and linguistic elements that are involved. But I think that's a very fair question, and that's a very fair question, possibly for any number of parishes. Uh, yes, thank you, Sister Vasa. Yes, we also have parishes in Munich, Australia, you know, Brussels, where, wherever. Um, so there is that challenge as well. But I do think that the time is right for Orthodox churches to go back to the canons to consider how geography and political organization manifests itself, what would be the more rational way to go about things. I think the time for that is ripe. I think some efforts at that were going to be made in 2016 in the council uh, that the Russian Orthodox Church basically sabotaged after it asked for a bunch of conditions that then didn't attend and not only withdrew its own participation, but other people didn't, didn't participate, other churches, other national churches didn't come as well. Now, after Father John, I don't, I'm never gonna use the word church anymore. <laughs> How about ch mother church and ecclesiastical organization? I think the time is, is right to reconsider ecclesiastical organization. I will say one other thing. There's a very bizarre irony for those of us in the Seacliff Glen Cove community who are a little older because when the OCA was granted autocephaly in the 70s, um, the people in Rokor ran around and screamed at how the OCA was too aligned with the communist government. And now the final irony is that the OCA is much more independent from the Russian government than the church abroad is. 
So the world is, is full of ironies. Their Namby Pambies too. Their condemnation or their discussion of Ukraine is very watered down. Well, but it's better, you know, so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Eliana, as always, superb presentation. I have a um, question here uh, from, um, actually two questions. The first one is from Olga Meyerson. Uh, I'll just read it directly. If you cut off from the Moscow Patriarchate, what will it mean from the point of view of Rokor's relationship with the rest of the Orthodox churches? As far as I remember, there was no Eucharistic communion with the OCA, and to the best of my early experience, with any of the Greek or local Orthodox churches. Um, I'm not sure that's 100% correct. I mean, there is Eucharistic communion now with the OCA. In Jerusalem, there was, I want to call it, half Eucharistic communion because the Rokor clergy did serve with the Jerusalem clergy some of the time in some of the ways. So there was Eucharistic communion there. There is also, of course, Eucharistic communion with the biggest diaspora Orthodox Church right now. And that is um, Metropolitan Anufri and the six million Ukrainians who are in Europe. I mean, there is Eucharistic communion between Rokor and that church. So it'll, it'll be, that's the next conference, guys. I mean, it's, I, don't th I don't have an answer. I'm just saying that these questions need to be asked, both from the perspective of, is Rokor going to view itself as international? As Sister Vasa points out, we're in all these countries. Um, do we break up into different countries? Um, ha what has been the experience in Europe? Um, I don't think it's been particularly happy with parishes voting to go one way or the other and then w wanting to vote again six weeks later. So it's, it's, it's a challenge, yes. But, you know, war and civil war and violence bring on challenges, and this is one of the challenges. But I would also like us to think of this as an opportunity to go back to the drawing board and to think about how do we function in a country with the First Amendment, with separation of church and state. But that's going to be the next talk about symphonia and war. And uh, a good segue, actually, uh, and appeals to your um, expertise, uh, especially because of the legal issues involved. This is from our, our very own uh, Katie. Uh, the question is the following. Can you address, and this is a critical point because a lot of people don't understand how the laws work separating church and state in the United States. The split of physical property, of real property, between the Moscow Patriarchate and Rokor. Well, I don't know the split of physical property between the Moscow Patriarchate and Rokor right now. I do know that the Moscow Patriarchate could change Rokor's regulation today. Um, the separation of church and state in the United States is very complicated. Sometimes it varies by state law by state law. But in general, there is a general rule that hierarchical churches, like the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, the Orthodox Church, that the parish belongs to the mother church and that parishes don't move. Like, that's why Our Lady of Kazan did not move. However, there are places where this happens. And there are exceptions to this rule. And there has been at least one state court, in my experience, um, in Massachusetts that allowed a parish to leave Rokor and go to another Orthodox jurisdiction. In part, you can all laugh, they just, the court justified this by saying that Rokor's administration was so messy that nobody could possibly figure out if it was hierarchical or not. So. <laughs> I mean, the court didn't quite put it that way, but it did. And it was one of my early bruisings as a lawyer, so I remember it very vividly. So the answer is, I don't know what would happen to individual parishes division between Moscow Patriarchate and Rokor. I think that probably no property has been transferred since 2007. I would be shocked. Yes. If you answer that, can you? 
Why don't, why don't you, no, why don't you just say that? The, New York has what's called the Religious Corporations Act, and it covers mm -hmm. all organized religions. And each religion, spokespeople from each religion, basically it's the constitution of how this particular religion is set up, like with, with us would be bishops and everything, and it would be like the local parish owns the property. It might say that, or it might say the property belongs to the diocese. And a court will, will look at that and that's what it will decide. American courts don't like to get involved in religious controversies if they can avoid them because you're going down a rabbit hole. Absolutely. No, and, and that's why I said it varies state by state. Yeah. And um, New York State has a very specific statutory provision on Russian Orthodox churches. The state of Massachusetts did not. And Massachusetts has a more congregational perspective, which may be why the court ruled that way. Again, it was a long time ago. I don't know if that case has any validity anywhere else other, outside Worcester, Massachusetts. You know, it's... In the United States, probably the one denomination that's been involved in this the most is the Episcopal Church. Which is why we're so grateful for their experience. <laughs> I would like to ask what kind of treatment we should be giving to the question of the conflation of ethnicity and orthodoxy in our experience in ROCOR. Because it goes against, although it is in line with Symphonia historically in Russia, it creates a dissonance for the faithful here, a dissonance that even a child can perceive and pushes back against and questions by you know, looking at us and saying, what are we doing? Why? Uh, and perhaps, perhaps discussing the fact that Jesus Christ himself said that there is no Jew and there is no Greek should be at the center of our conversation. What is important to him is that we love each other, that we the, follow the commandments, and to see those as truth and everything else as, as a distortion of that truth. Um, so perhaps the path forward here for us is to, as hard as it is to say for me, who loves singing in Slavonic, and, and speaking Russian, that we need to separate ourselves from a, the ethnic part of us when we talk about our church and we talk about our religion. Um, so what, what would you well, think I, about I that would, discussion? I would totally agree with you when I have raised this issue with clergy over the years, as I have for decades, they would say our church was founded as a Russian refuge. And I would go, a Christian refuge or a Russian refuge? You know, and, and by remaining so focused on Russianness, we are, in effect, playing into the Ruski Mir narrative and leaving ourselves open um, to, that, to that problem. And I also love Church Slavonic. I mean, even, even last summer, I took a course in Church Slavonic. It's a beautiful language. It's fascinating. It's great to know. But if we are going to reach out with a broader missionary purpose. We're supposed to go out and baptize the nations, right? That is not appropriate. And just a few Sundays ago, my possibly favorite gospel reading was the Samaritan woman. She's the first person who gets told, other than the mother of God, that Christ is the Messiah. We don't know what language they spoke in, but I doubt it was Hebrew. It was probably Samaritan, right? So it's, your point is, is completely valid. It is also true that the way our church was founded was a diaspora church. And this is now going back to Ukraine. There is the same problem there. Is it a six million diaspora church or is it an Orthodox church that happens to be located in Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, wherever they are? What is it? You know, and they're, they're gonna have to confront it in, in some bigger picture way. 
but I see I'm being told to. And I'm sorry I wasn't really good with this thing. No, you really. Um, oh. I, I did th throw out some handouts. There's something on Decree 362, and there's also a little table comparing the situation.